Good morning, church. It's good to be here. I'm really blessed to be able to worship here, not just with the team here, but also with you online. Today's message is titled, Leaving the Wilderness. And I want to encourage you, before we begin the message, please interact with the sermon. We've got a base thing going on here. Yeah, we've got bass for me. Before we begin the message, please feel free to interact with the sermon and our community. Uh, Roland and I really enjoy and appreciate your feedback, even if it's something you disagree with. We welcome open civil dialogue, and part of the journey is understanding each other and uh, uh, discerning our different views, perspectives, in the light of his unchanging eternal word. So don't be shy. Be shy. Um, and a lot of times it's really enjoyable. So um, let's see here. Here's some highlighted comments from two weeks ago on Father's Day. Maddie still wants her sister to be called Yoshi. Uh, Luchi is thankful for her dad, Papa Shang. Hi, Luchi. Hi, Ian. Wes is pre worship stretch challenged. And Chris heard the word Ohana in Stitch's voice. Jeffrey realizes Jesus' airbender awesomeness, and Adeline gives kudos to Colette for her first time serving on our worship team, even while preggers. It's really quite amazing. So uh, that was from two weeks ago. Last week, people were grateful to the audiovisual team. Will thought the sermon was on fire, and Ryan quoted Roland, the word of God is lit. So by commenting, you're actually benefiting the community because you're helping others think more deeply, you're help, helping others be more thankful, you're helping everyone remember more clearly because saying, saying these things reminds me of what Roland, I, had, I watched it the day after because I, I guess preached at another church. And it also helps us to maintain our bonds as a community of faith. Okay. So uh, I have little slides, I got booming going on but I have the slides a little out of order. Um, last Sunday, we started a new series in the book of Joshua. Let me give a quick background. Around 2100 BC, God called a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. He promised to raise up from them a nation that would actually save the world. And they were super old, so when they had Isaac, they actually had a laughing party. That's where he gets his name from. It means laughter. Isaac himself had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And they moved to Egypt because of a famine. They originally arrived as VIP guests, but ended up serving as Egyptian slaves for 430 years. So, Remember, God had promised Abraham that he would raise up a nation, he would give them a promised land. God didn't forget that. He raised up Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. So they started around 1446 BC with conservatively one million people. And two years into the journey, they arrive at the border of the promised land. I don't know if I... Is it here? No, it's not. It's too bad. Kadesh Barnea. I don't know if you can see it. It's, I don't have a, okay. They sent 12 spies in. 10 gave a report that was unfavorable. 10 gave a report that was basically characterized by unbelief. Only two spies trusted God. So because of their unbelief and disobedience, they had actually reached the steps of the promised land, but because of their unbelief and disobedience, they wandered for another 38 years. This is the context of what we're going through. So a whole generation has died, and Israel has a whole new generation who were born in the wilderness, plus these two older patriarchs, Joshua and Caleb, the only two spies who were faithful and trusting in God's promise. 
So about this time, we have conservatively two million Israelites. They were staring across the Jordan River, anxiously awaiting God to fulfill the promise of a home. So I want us to be very careful how we read the Old Testament. It's very tempting to read the Old Testament as a how-to book. How can I get that girlfriend? How can I get that... Primarily a holy book that shows God's faithfulness to His promises. It shows His power to overcome humanly impossible circumstances. It shows that he keeps his promise from hundreds of years before, not just to raise up a nation, but to deliver them to a promised land, even when they are unbelieving and disobedient. Now, a secondary or metaphorical interpretation is valid only through very, very careful study, confirmation by mature believers, and better yet, through other scripture passages. So, thankfully, the Bible makes plentiful mention of Egypt, of Exodus, of the wilderness, and of the promised land. Joshua is not mainly a book about good leadership. I looked at the, on the internet, and I looked through all these different sermons, and I probably read a dozen or two dozen sermons on Joshua, and a lot of them were about how to be a good leader. But that's not what the book is about. It really, it's about God. God's faithfulness to an unfaithful people. It's not about how to lead a company. It's not a book about military strategy. It's not a book on how to be successful, though many will take that verse out of context. Thankfully, the Bible does give us valid, legitimate metaphors for Egypt, Exodus, the wilderness, and the promised land. And I want you to listen very carefully because this is crucial if you want to grow as a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh, it came out already. I was hoping to do it one line by line. But Egypt represents when we were not yet believers. We were slaves to sin. And there are tons of verses that talk about that. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, Matthew 2, 15, and the prophecy that was given for that in Hosea 11, 1. In Egypt, Israel were slaves to sin under great oppression. In Exodus, it represents us as being new believers, delivered out of sin. And oftentimes there are these great miracles that happen. The ten plagues, remember? Jesus as our, as our Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And so this is not something that I just pull out of thin air. This is something the Bible talks about. Egypt represents when we were not believers. The Exodus represents when they left Egypt. It represents salvation, deliverance from sin. Thirdly, the wilderness represents this immature, disobedient, unfaithful, rebellious, bored believers, always complaining. And a lot of believers, unfortunately, stay at that level throughout most of their Christian life. And you shouldn't be at that level. We should be at the level of overcoming, of triumph, of obedience and joy. But a lot of us if you say you're a Christian and you're bored, it might be because you're still in the wilderness. If you're, in the, if you're a Christian and you keep complaining, it's probably because you're still a wilderness believer. And this is a very important concept to understand. It, it's super important because I don't want any of you believers who are listening to this to stay a wilderness believer. And you find that in Jeremiah 7, 21 to 26. You find that throughout the whole book, the entire book of Isaiah, Many, many different references to this, just this wilderness believing. And finally, we have promised land believers. Believers who are obedient, committed, joyful, triumphant, serving wholehearted, sacrificial, fully engaged with their faith community. And we see this in the metaphor of Jesus as Israel, uh, Luke 9.31. 51. We see this in Hebrews 4, this whole idea of rest. And some people say that that's actually heaven. And many pastors actually think, no, that is a triumphant, overcoming believer's life. So Israel's history actually serves as a paradigm. Hebrew even says this. Hebrew, uh, Israel's history serves as a paradigm 
for us as followers of Jesus Christ to identif identify where am I in my spiritual walk? And if we find ourselves in the wilderness, we better get out of the wilderness and head into the promised land. Okay, let me go back a few slides here. A little bit out of order. Okay. So that's the context. That's the historical context, the biblical context. I want us to see the big picture. Right? They've left Egypt. They reached the promised land in two years. It should have taken them only 11 days, but it took them two years. And because they were unfaithful, they had to wander for another 38. And I don't want any of us to be wandering for years on end, living in defeatedness, boredom, complaints. Join me in prayer, would you? Hello, loving dad. We gather online here to give you praise. To give you the worship that only you deserve. Please give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Soften our hearts so that they will be moved by your spirit and your, and your word only. Quicken our hands and feet so that we're ready to act. Change us by your word to further your kingdom. Make us more mature believers as a result of your word in Jesus' name. Jaden serves as our scripture reader today, so please uh, direct your attention to her. Oh, I'm going to start this over again. Hello? Okay, I'll try that one more time. Good morning. <laughs> Are we ready? Good morning, church. Today's scripture comes. Good morning, church. Today's scripture comes from Joshua chapter one, verses ten through eighteen. Please be blessed as you give attention to the reading of God's word. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them, until the Lord gives the rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it land that Moses the servant of the Lord gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. This is the holy and errant word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jaden. Okay. Oh, let me uh, let me cover this. Let's go here. All right. So to fill in the blanks of the beginning, we got Egypt, Exodus, and the wilderness. How do we prepare ourselves to leave the wilderness? How do we prepare ourselves to leave immaturity, to leave complaining, to leave unbelief and disobedience behind? The first point we see here is prepare to pivot. Prepare to pivot. See, Joshua commanded the officers of the people in verse 11, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people. Prepare your provisions. So he's, he's communicating this to all the people. Prepare your provisions. At, immediately after hearing from God, Joshua instructs all the people to take action, to make a lifestyle change, to pivot. And what are they pivoting to? Okay. 
He doesn't say build. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. He doesn't say build a boat because the Jordan River at this time is turbulent. It's quite deep in some areas. It's dangerous. He doesn't say build a bridge. He says make prepare provisions. And provisions, this word literally means meat. Prepare food. He's saying. Why food? And if you're a, a war buff, you understand that half of winning the war is having good supply lines, understanding that you've got to prepare food for your soldiers. You can't just send soldiers in to battle and then they'll starve to death, right? Why food provisions? Because somehow, maybe God tells Joshua, but somehow Joshua knows once they step foot into the promised land, the manna they've been receiving for 40 years will stop. You catch that? It's quite significant. You're not going to see this in the text, but I'm telling you, because I've done a lot of reading and research, okay? I, I can't take credit for this. For 40 years, they relied on manna, but it was time to change their desert diet to promised land food. What did manna taste like? Remember that? It tasted like honey and coriander seed. Honey and coriander seed. And what did the spies come back saying that the promised land was full of? They described the land as being a land of milk and honey. So manna is a foretaste. You see the honey there? And coriander seed does take a little rich and a little oily, kind of like milk. So manna was always there to serve as a foretaste of the real abundance of food in the promised land. And for 40 years, they relied on God to feed them. Six days, they had manna, just like dew on the ground. They just picked it up, they processed it. They probably learned dozens of different ways to instant pot, I mean, to cook it, right? Um, and then finally, as they enter the promised land, Joshua knows, hey, there ain't going to be no manna anymore. We've got to prepare some food. We've got to change our lifestyle. We can't keep depending on this food that's provided us all the time. Those of you who play basketball, you know what a pivot foot is. Pivot foot. Before you take a dribble, you can turn your body around that pivot foot. That pivot foot cannot move. But once you see an advantage, the, the clear way to go, to drive to the basket or take an open shot, you can leave your pivot foot and move. You're actually changing from one direction to another. That's what it means to pivot. Since their diet will change, they needed to be ready for this. Wilderness believers are becoming promised land believers. And this metaphor is valid here. We cannot depend on others to feed us every day. I've had people say, oh, Pastor Ted, please read with me the Bible, please. Uh, and I say, okay. And so at one point I read a uh, devotional every day to, to some students. I was happy to do it, but I was, you know, encouraged them. You have to read the Bible on your own. You got to step out of the wilderness and head into the promised land. You can't depend on others to feed you all the time. You got to prepare provisions for yourselves. We need to learn to be active and hungry and responsible to feed ourselves. And some of you had told me or asked me before, Ted, how come you emphasize the daily reading of, Bible, of the Bible so often? Aren't Sunday sermons enough? Aren't these inductive studies that we have in fellowship enough? Well, it's enough if you want to remain a reluctant, immature, rebellious, wandering, complaining, bored believer. Yeah, it's enough if you want to stay a wilderness believer. But it's not enough if you want to enter into God's rest and enter into God's promises and become a promised land believer. And that's why every time we have a Bible drive, I'm so excited when I see middle schoolers, high schoolers, collegians, young adults, even mature believers say, I'm finally going to read through this Bible verse by verse. I'm going to read the Bible every day. So Joshua tells us people, prepare to pivot. Your diet's going to change. You need to make a lifestyle change if you want to exit the wilderness and enter the promised land. For within three days, he says, you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. See, the Jordan symbolizes a boundary, 
a barrier to cross. If God calls you to the promised land, there will be a barrier to cross. There will be obstacles to overcome. Sometimes it will feel humanly impossible. See, Jordan was very deep. It was turbulent. It was treacherous. It could be life-taking. And when I first arrived at this church, there seemed to be a humanly impenetrable obstacle. See, 25-some young adults had left. In fact, that's the reason why I was called to this church. These 25 adults ran worship, ran AV, hosting, youth ministries, you name it, they did so much of it. Yes, Life Fellowship did a lot, praise God, but these young adults did so much. And I thought, man, what am I getting myself into? There's no worship team. There's no AV team. There's no one taking care of youth ministry. Yet here we are today, five years later. We have a, praise God, a new young adult, a, a young a youth minister, a youth pastor. We have young adults who have filled in. We have something we didn't have before. We have a young married couples. We have a growing number of next generation babies popping out. Not only has he replenished, he has added a new fellowship. We have more youngins in the English congregation than before. And so God has richly restored and added even more abundantly than what we had before. And when you get to a number, we see here three days, right? When you get to see a number in the Bible, there's usually something spiritually significant. Three represents divinity, the Trinity, right? It also, re, it also symbolizes fullness and completion and permanence, perfection, even resurrection. Joshua symbolically says we will permanently, completely leave the wilderness to never return again. And the spiritual application is quite obvious here. Think about your life. When God calls us to maturity, he never wants us to revert back to immaturity. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That stage of our spiritual life has permanently, fully, completely ended, and we've moved on to bigger, better, more influential things. Hopefully you can say, today, I am closer to Jesus than I was two years ago. And if you can't say that, you might still be walking in the wilderness. You've got to get out of that wilderness. Because you don't want to keep crossing that same Jordan over and over again. And then next, there's this legal term of possession. It's divine legal ownership. Just to remind us all, this is 3,500 years ago. And the people that were driven out don't exist today. Okay, and That's the most political I'm going to get right here. The Palestinians that are called Palestinians were not actually pa Palestinians. That was a recently made term. It comes from the word Philistine. Joshua learned as Moses' right hand at Kadesh Barnea. Remember they got there in two years? Israel rebelled and said, oh, we're, no, we're not going to go in there. We're like grasshoppers against these giants. We can't go in there. Even though God says he will give us victory, we're too scared. And because of that mistake, they wandered for another 38 years. Now he receives God's divine order. And he makes sure to act promptly. He learned from past mistakes. They rebelled. You see, 38 years ago, they rebelled at Kadesh Barnea. They weren't fully ready to enter the promised land. Moses said, let's go. They said no. But the next day, they had regrets. Moses said, sorry, you missed your opportunity. And they said, no, 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 no. We're going in. We're going to fight these guys. We're going to claim our promised land. But then Moses said, well, I'm not going. Aaron's not going. The Ark of the Covenant's not going. You're going to go without us? You're going to go without God's presence? If you go, you'll be demolished because God's not going with you. You had your chance. So what do they do? They go in anyway. And just like Moses predicted, they got squished. They got repelled. They were destroyed, obliterated. And Joshua learned 
from that mistake 30 years ago. He's not about to commit that same mistake again. He said, let's go in three days. Let's go possess the land that God has promised to us. So the application here is take the opportunity that God has given you. Our obstacles usually are fear, insecurity, doubt, or laziness. When you go somewhere, do you ever get this impression? Uh, why don't you just say hi to the cashier? Ask him or ask her how they're doing. And I get that impression sometimes. And sometimes I do. And sometimes I don't. It's like, no, I'm, in a, I'm in a rush, God. I, 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 gotta, I have an appointment. I've got to go home. I'm, I'm hungry. You know, I've got this fried chicken. I've got to go feed my family, right? And, and then afterwards, I kind of regret it. It's like, all, all God asked was for me to say hi. <laughs> right? We've got to take the opportunities that God gives us. And why are believers bored? Why do we complain? It's because we don't take the opportunities of faith God puts in our laps. And it saddened me to, hear, to learn that the millennial generation, the largest generation in US history, 80 million people, only 4% are Bible believers. This explains why our country has left its values. This explains to me why there's so much anarchy, uh, why there's so much senseless violence. Yes, we should, we should cry out against injustice, but no, we should not compound injustice with more violence and more bloodshed. So prepare to pivot if you're serious about your Christian walk. The second point is fully identify as God's people. Verse 12. To the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, Jordan said, remember the word. They wanted to settle on the, on the other side of the Jordan. And Moses said, you, sh you shouldn't do this. That's not the promised land. But since you insist, just remember, when we go into the promised land, you need a promise to send your men to fight alongside with us until God gives us rest. So two and a half tribes choose to settle outside the promised land. We'll settle there. It's good for our herds, they say. It's great pasture land. It's a wonderful place to build cities for our children. And Moses reluctantly agreed on the condition that they will fight with the other nine and a half tribes. If you don't, Moses says, God will judge you for abandoning your people. So what's this a sign of? These two and a half tribes settled for a substitute. They were so enamored with their livestock. They are next to the promised land, but they're not in it. They focused on their children, saying, oh, we can build really nice cities here for our kids. And so Joshua reminds them of their promise. Without unity, they will fail. There will be dysfunction. This is Satan's strategy of divide and conquer. This is Satan's strategy to have a settle for something lesser than God's promise. See, people want to do their own thing. People see something and they think, ah, oh, this has got to be better than whatever God has in store for me. They put their personal will, their personal agenda above God's above the church, above their fellowship. They put their jobs, you know, the herds, that's, that was their jobs. They put their jobs, their children, ahead of God and his people. And if we're honest here, who can blame them? We do that ourselves. Isn't that what we do? You know, buy houses, better jobs, our kids, before the church before God's people, before the fellowship, before Sunday service. Now, the reason I have a Disneyland tram photo up here is because I heard this story and it just stuck with me. This, uh, these parents told me that once they, they brought their kid, four years old, to Disneyland. And um, they got ready, they got you know, the child's bag, etc. And their kid was so excited, they wanted to spend the whole day there. Get out of the car, they go sit in the tram. And as they're sitting in the tram, the kid's so, so excited, just keeps giggling and just jumping, and like, oh, this is awesome, this is great. And so they arrive at the front gates of Disneyland, and you know, you're supposed to get off and head in. 
Well, guess what? The kid does not want to get up. Doesn't want to get off the tram. Why? He said, come on, let's go. Disneyland's over there. And the kid said, no, I want to stay here. He thought the tram was Disneyland. He was having so much fun on the tram that he said, no, I want to go, let's go for another ride around the, the parking lot. And the, the parents were like, it's much better inside. There's Mickey Mouse, Spinny Mouse, Goofy, all these great rides. Come on. He said, no, I want to stay here. And so they ended up riding around the parking lot a few times. And he just wouldn't get off the tram. We think the substitute is better than God's agenda. We think if I just work a little harder, if I just do a little more overtime, that'll get me over the hump and I'll and then I can miss fellowship, I can miss Sunday service, I'll stay up super late, you know, barely get up in time for Sunday service. We think I'm gonna settle, I'm gonna take things into my own hand. When God says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all the things that you actually desire for will be added to you. The problem is we flip the formula around. We seek all those other things first and we put God's kingdom aside. Don't be like those two and a half tribes. We've got to fully identify as God's people. We've got to hold fellowship as sacred. Because if you're not there, that means someone is receiving less love because you're not there to love them. Some, some come to church to network for jobs. Some come to church for customers, you know, for clients. Others to find a date, to find a future spouse. They don't want someone at a bar, you know, what? I don't want to find someone, you know, who goes to a bar, right? I'd rather find someone at a church. A better character people go to church. Other people come for other agendas to gain power. I'm going to rise up the leadership ranks and just show everyone how awesome I am. Personal agendas get in the way of God's agenda. And we see this in Luke 9, 57 to 62. They're examples of people with personal agendas. People who think, oh, I'm going to take my my job into my own hands and, and miss this fellowship or, or n neglect my duties here. Think, but God says, no, seek first the kingdom of God. Because once we follow Jesus, it's all or no nothing. We must fully identify as God's people. Do not be like those two and a half tribes. Ah, that's what I wanted to say, and I'm almost there. Do you know your spiritual gifts? Are you using them to build up the church? I love the fact that we have people with musical gifts, art, artistic gifts, technical gifts, and they're all working hard to get this live stream going. It's a madhouse here Sunday morning. Today was incredibly crazy because we're trying to transition a whole bunch of different equipment, new equipment. Do you know your spiritual gifts? How are you using them to build up the church? Guess which tribes in Israel's history were the first to go pagan? Yeah, those two and a half who lived on the other side of the Jordan. Guess which tribes were the first to be conquered by the Assyrians in 722? Yeah, those two and a half tribes. And then much later, there's a story of Jesus when he goes east to Gadarene. Remember the guy who was possessed by a legion of demons? Remember that? Jesus casts out these demons into a herd of pigs. The pigs go off a cliff. And what is the response of the people who live there? They're called Gadarenes, by the way. They say to Jesus, get out of here. You killed our pigs. Now think about it. Where does this word Gadarene come from? They are from the tribe of Gad. They're, they're part of those two and a half tribes that stayed outside the promised land. This Jewish tribe kept defiled, unkosher pigs. They weren't happy that this possessed guy was freed. They didn't rejoice over that. Instead, they were ticked off that they had lost their herd of pigs. So I want you to see the result of these two and a half tribes. And finally, avoid half-hearted, rash promises. Verse 16, and they answered Joshua, 
all that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Now, this is not what you're going to hear from other churches. This is not what I read in the almost two dozen sermons that I read through in preparation for this. All the different sermons said, wow, what a great vow. What an awesome pledge, right? The people of Israel are all gung-ho. They're passionate. They're, they're faithful. It seems really nice. It seems like a blessing to Joshua. There are two problems with this. And I wonder, hmm, if you're the first one to see a problem of verse 17, type it in. I'm going to send you a $5 Starbucks card. What's the problem with verse 17? Anyone? And i got a 15-second lag here, so I'm going to keep talking. Right? The grammatical problem with this is in the second half of verse 17, only may the Lord your God be with you. Actually, the position of that word only in Hebrew negates whatever's before. All right. This is based off of Hebrew scholars, not me. Okay, my Hebrew was just all right. I did get a good grade in Hebrew, but my Hebrew is just rusty. My Greek is much better, okay? And what these Hebrew linguistic scholars say is, what they're actually saying is, God will only be with you. That's what they're saying. Just as God was only with Moses. What's wrong with verse 17? Hmm. Okay, thank you for posting the, the verse. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. What's wrong with the first half of verse 17? Anyone get it yet? Anyone? Did you get it? You get the Starbucks card, yes. <laughs> yes, right. Just as, we, just as we obeyed Moses in all things. Peggy, our worship leader, discerned correctly. Did they obey Moses in all things? Heck no. They were constantly groaning and moaning and complaining. Oh, why did you lead us out here to the wilderness to die, right? You remember hearing that? Oh, if you read through the book of Exodus, they say that over and over and over again. It's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I said, we had so much good food in Egypt. They'd totally forgotten and blanked out that they were slaves and being mistreated. It's, oh, we had so much food in Egypt. Now you left us out here to die. They just were so disobedient, so rebellious. Whatever Moses commanded them, almost every time, they would talk back, right? And so what kind of a promise is this? This is a half-hearted, and you can use a different part of the body if you want. This is a half-hearted promise. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, we will obey him. Hmm. You know, I'm going to give both Peggy and Lucci. Because Lucci was the first also online. And uh, online, there's a 15 second lag, 15, 30 second lag. Okay? Lucci, I'm giving it to you. Be happy. You don't have to be sad. Okay, Lucci? All right. Love it, love it. I'm glad you're, you're tracking along with this. So they didn't obey Moses. And later on, as Roland and I preached through Joshua, we're going to find out did they keep this promise? No. In the same way they disobeyed Moses, they disobeyed Joshua too. They keep complaining, they keep disobeying. And did they put anyone to death? No. So that was a rash promise. A rash promise. As we will see, Israel constantly does not listen to their leaders. Not to Moses, not to Joshua. So Joshua has to rely solely on God. And God really was truly only with Joshua. Because the Israelites disappoint him over and over and over again. Okay. And I... I I want to apply that to us. A lot of times we start the new year, I'm going to finish the Bible in a year. And I say, oh, hold your horses. How about in three? Because if you do it in one year, that's about five, you know, three to five chapters a day. That's a lot. 
That's a lot. So just read. I tell people, you don't have to spend a whole hour because you're going to give up. You're going to get discouraged. Just read a little bit every day. Spend some time with God in the morning and spend some time with Him in the evening. You know, start your day right. Be in love with Him. It's not a chore. It, it, he's a person that we meet every day, and we want to listen to Him. And so, hmm. So instead of making these half-hearted, rash promises, just do the right thing every day. Just do the right things every day. Love someone. Instead of playing video games for three hours a night, before you play, just give someone in your fellowship a call and say, hey, how are you doing? Just wanted to say hi. You know, we have all this physical distancing thing, but we're part of the same fellowship. How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? How can I bless you? you know, just do that. Just five minutes. I guarantee you will be more joyful every day. I guarantee it. You'll actually be blessing someone. And when we bless other people, we in turn are blessed with God's joy. God is completely trustworthy. His promises are completely bankable. He is unchanging. He never lies. God cannot sin. And so when God gives us a promise, just as Roland taught us last week, we need to be familiar with all of God's promises. Let's start listing them out. Keep a list of your top ten God's promises to all believers. And we need to claim them every day. We need to have faith in them and stop complaining. Stop disobeying. Start living as promised land believers. No more wilderness, please. No more boredom. <laughs> no more struggling over and over with the same sins. Oh, no, I lost it. Okay. There was a man named Stanley William McKenna Walker. His family lived in England. This was a little while ago. And his father was a very wealthy shipbuilder. He chose to stake out his own life. He moved to the United States, tried a bunch of different ventures, spent all his money. He ended up an alcoholic, living on the streets, and homeless. And one day, his dad died, left him a huge inheritance. It'd be worth about a billion dollars today. A billion dollars. And so the lawyers were sent over to look for Stanley William McKenna Walker and say, you are the sole heir to this inheritance. When they arrived, they discovered that he had actually died the day before. True story. Penniless, alone, no one cared for him. He was just a homeless guy on the street. My point is this. As believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we've been promised this rich, generous, abundant inheritance full of joy, full of peace. Yeah, stuff around will be in chaos. There will be challenges at work. There will be difficulties in relationships. But you see, the promise is still there for us. God equips us to be able to handle each of these obstacles with greater authority, confidence, and even victory if we will only be promised land believers. Don't be like that boy who just stayed on the tram and didn't realize all that he was missing at Disneyland. Don't be like Stanley William McKenna Walker who had this inheritance of a billion dollars, today's money, and yet he died penniless. He died destitute. He died unloved just the day before he was to receive that inheritance. So my hope and my prayer while I was preparing this sermon was that we would all desire to leave the wilderness, to leave our immaturity, to leave complaining behind, and head in to the promised land. And how do we do that? Three ways. Number one, we need to pivot. We need to make lifestyle changes. It's time to grow up. We can't depend on other people to keep feeding us. We have to take responsibility for our spiritual growth. And part of that is prayer. Part of that is Bible reading. Church leaders, you must 
participate in prayer meetings. I, it just you know, puts me to shame. I'm really grateful for the church leaders who do. God bless you. I'm so grateful for faithful brothers who do. And they're not even church leaders. But we have a few church leaders. I, I want you to get off your butt. You can't lead. You can't have this title if you're not leading in prayer. We need to pivot. We need to change our lifestyles. We need to prioritize the kingdom, not have all these excuses. Secondly, we need to fully identify with, as God's people. Stop giving excuses. Oh, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. This is, fellowship is holy. It's not plan B. It's not an option. Do I feel like it? What's in it for me? Fellowship is where we... Iron sharpens iron. Fellowship is where we share our burdens, where we lift each other up, where we encourage each other, where we share laughter and growth. And thirdly, we need to avoid these half-hearted promises. We need to avoid these rash promises and just do the right things daily. Just be a passionate follower of Christ instead of making all these grand promises that we'll never keep. And so please pull up a Yes, God isn't changing. Please pull up the response slip at uh, tinyurl.com slash OCCEC dash response. We'd love to interact with you. Uh, Roland and I are, are working to do a better job following up with you in your prayer requests as well as your responses. Uh, if you have questions, please ask in the comments or here as well. Okay. This is a t if you're willing to do this, you're probably willing to change. If you're not willing to do this, then that, that's okay, that's all right. No one's forcing you. But most likely, it's gonna go in one year and out the other. Okay. Circle the letter A, or check the letter A if you remember. Um, I don't have it here, it's down here. If you are tired of the wilderness, if you're tired of complaining all the time, if you're tired of being bored, if you're tired of struggling with the same sins over and over again, and you're ready to pivot by feeding your soul daily, by making lifestyle changes. So check the letter A. Secondly, um, check B if you're going to commit to more, commit more fully to your faith community, to identify as God's people. Right? I'm really excited with young adults. We have six college grads, and I've been praying that we love each one of these college grads, these new young adults into our community. Really, really grateful and looking forward to that. Um, C, instead of unkept promises, maybe just want to do a simple, small lifestyle change. Just daily do what's right. Instead of promising, I'm going to read five chapters a day, just, just read 10 verses, five verses. That literally only takes 30 seconds. And just say, hi, good morning, God. Thank you for this day. You're your day will change. I guarantee you, if you do this in the morning and in the evening, just knowing God is present with you will change your life. Check D if you'll memorize Joshua 1.9. I know that wasn't the part of the message today, but that was a great passage, and it was a good message from last week. So if you want to memorize it, I encourage you. It's worth memorizing. And if you're interested in becoming a follower of Christ, interested in baptism, interested in becoming a member, please let us know. We're going to have a, a baptism membership class soon. Otherwise, if you have any other questions, comments, snide remarks, please leave them on the response slip. Okay? Father, keep writing. Father, I'm really grateful for this passage. It's, it's to me, it's really mind-blowing that you would use an entire nation and their struggles as a metaphor for our individual spiritual walk. Help us to learn, help us to be discerning, and help us not to make the same mistakes as the Israelites did and, and wander for another 38 years unnecessarily. It gets real tiring, God. So take us out of the wilderness and help us to pivot, to identify fully as your people, to not make these half-hearted rash promises. Thank you.